Welcome to the 53rd episode of the Game 4 podcast. In this episode, still recording from home, we'll talk about how you can produce your own DIY tabletop game in 2021, just like I did. Uh, I'm Adam. I'm Matt. And this is the Game 4 podcast. Game 4 is a platform to help connect tabletop gamers and to help you get more out of your tabletop gaming. Matt and I are part of a software development and design company called Milkan. And because most of the folks at Milkan love tabletop games, we developed the Game4 app and launched it in early 2020 or 2018. Um, we launched the this companion podcast in June of 2019 to help tabletop gamers get more enjoyment out of their hobby. Due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, we hibernated the Game4 app in July of 2020 and planned to bring back a retooled version of the app for Android, iOS, and the web when gaming in person is safer. Until then, we'll keep bringing you this podcast to help you get more out of your tabletop gaming. So speaking of tabletop gaming, getting more out of it, have you been able yeah. to get more out of yours recently? I have. Um, That's good. That's good. <laughs> as things get get busier, I've found more time to game. I don't understand. but That's weird. Yeah. We'll have you been that. sleeping? Um, I think so. Maybe right. not. Maybe, maybe that's where I found my time. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we, I, we got in our, uh, our next session of Pathfinder, um, finally, um, it was fun. We had to, we had to kind of recap it for ourselves, you know, like last time, um, what did we mm -hmm. do? Um, because it had been a little while, but, uh, yeah, it, um, I am really enjoying, uh, I'm playing an alchemist. Um, so you kind of make like little concoctions and bombs and Potions traps and stuff. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you also get to kind of throw stuff and i don't know it's just kind of different it's different from anything i've played before i'm really kind of liking it um even at first level and it seems like it's going to just get more fun from here um but yeah that and then just the uh, pathfinder 2.0 rules in general um there's definitely some things i really like about it uh i like just how expansive the characters um are for creation um like there's a lot of customization going into just a you know your level one character where I feel mm -hmm. like D and D, um, in my experience, has been it's a unless you go with some like really weird class or something like that, your characters seem very vanilla until you get into like a third or fourth level. Um, whereas this, I feel like um, I could do the same class and even same race and still be a pretty unique character um, right from the get go. So um, yeah, liking some of that stuff. I remember playing Neverwinter Nights, the PC game back in the mm. day, which was based off of third edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I'm pretty yep. sure, which third edition that is right. closer to Pathfinder than, say, fifth edition D&D &D is, from what I understand. Right. Yeah. 3.5 yeah. was 1.0. Oh, and yeah, if I remember right. But I just remember like in the early, like we would play like in a group, we'd all go over to our friend's house and have like a LAN party. And in the early parts of the game, it would be a situation where I'd be like, guys, guys, the dog, the dog is chasing me because I was like a sorcerer or, or yeah. a magic user or something <laughs> like that. And I just was like, I can't do anything about this. And then, you know, over the course of the afternoon or the whatever, as we kept playing and kept leveling up, you know, it would get to the point where we would like walk into a situation and we're like, roughly all 15th level and i'd be like okay you guys just stand back i'll take care of this and then just like set right. the entire room on fire and so yeah. there was a lot of like like everybody else is pretty competent when i was like a magic user at level one and i was not particularly competent but then later on it seemed like i you know it was real swingy that way yeah and it I really suppose ramped that's, up on that right and i can see that with pathfinder where like you know everybody's a little whereas like i i think the in D D fifth edition everybody kind of starts like you said very much the same so it's it's not until yeah things kind of really start to progress but, yeah but even this like like you know i am not i don't feel as squishy um like mm -hmm. i i think i might have been knocked down but i got up again um nice <laughs> I sorry i had to go tub thumping <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um I know at least a couple of us got knocked down and I, you know, but I didn't, I, it didn't feel like it was right away. It was just like, oh yeah, I, I deserve to get kicked down on this, but mm -hmm. I didn't feel squishy. Um, even though we were all kind of squishy. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I'm really yeah. liking it. Well, that's cool. It and could just be our doing. GM. He, you know, he's just a brilliant GM. That's true. <laughs> And now he's listening, and I'm hopefully he, I'll get some cool magic item next time. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, for, boys and girls, always pander to your GM. That's true. Uh, but yeah, so we got that. Um, I've been a lot of printing lately. Um, 3D printing fact, stuff, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> to the point where 
I had messed up um, on my own um, because I was not very smart. And I've got like those build plates, those magnetic build plates I, sh- I showed you mm-hmm. to get. Yep. Um, so I always order them with like two of them so that I can kind of like let one kind of dry after cleaning it. Sure. Um, so Makes that sense. I can make sure, especially because I'm using washable resin, that I feel like if I put a plate covered in water, that would be bad. Um, right, because the resin wouldn't stick to it as well. Yeah, yeah that, that makes is, sense. That's my thought. So yeah. I always kind of swap in and out. Well, apparently it had been like I don't know, a couple weeks since I had printed, and I apparently had both of them set out to dry. So I did not one, but two whole entire like six hour prints um without the uh magnetic build plate so nothing stuck and just kind of uh stuck to all the the the, the film and stuff so ruined print oh, and then yeah, you had yeah. to, i had to clean the tank and one of those two times i apparently pulled a hole in the film at the bottom and, of the resin tank. Yeah, yeah yeah and didn't realize it um and did another like four and a half hour print um, and got down back downstairs to see like resin kind of like oozing out from around the, uh, the the top of the case. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, there was resin just yeah, kind of just sticky everywhere. Um, yeah, that's a bummer. So yeah, I got to clean up that mess, which was not fun, and then got to spend. I I didn't have any extra film on order because El Goose sending me free ones because I did their like. If you sign up on Facebook, they uh, send you free film to replace. Oh, okay. Sure, but it just it takes like six to eight weeks. But I'm like, sure, well, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, I won't need that for six to eight weeks. Well, no. So I had to do a rush order to get some ones in, so I could get these other prints out of these orders. Yeah. And then I got to spend uh, forty minutes, you know, undoing. I, there's got to be sixty um, little Allen screws that you have to do go around and stuff and. On the yeah. tank, 60? yeah. On the on the wow. resin, uh, there's got yeah. I would say sixty is probably not a, a huge exaggeration. Forty to sixty, I would say. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's not fun to do. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, so yeah. So that I got to do that, but uh, so yeah. Be back careful up with your uh, with your FEP film, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and that's why I use like the the plastic razor blades I sent you. Um, because they're less likely to do that, and uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so. I got I ordered those uh, uh, by your um, suggestion, and so those plastic razor blades are it's is it, is it, they look like regular razor blades, just they're orange yeah. plastic and not metal. Which I'm like, oh, yeah. I mean, they're still sharp, but they're less like likely to poke holes. And I sure. still probably wouldn't use them on your film, which is what I did. But mm-hmm. I also yeah, I I made a lot of mistakes. So there was like one of those things, like if there any like one of five steps, I would not have been in the issue I was, but um, I kind of exasperated my own problems. So right, right, yeah. Oh yeah. well, but hey, it's it's still better than filament printing most days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I've been doing that. Um, also, uh, I've been working with Lee Gaddis from Gaddis Gaming. Um, mm-hmm. On, he's got some new stuff for that um, I'm going to be helping him get uh, printed and delivered. And I'm actually going to possibly help him do some modeling. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not... I, I was a little... I, it took me a little while before I said yes to it. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, it's, I'm not doing any, like, like people. I'm just, it's, sure. uh, it's more mechanical. And, I, and I've done... 3d stuff like that already um not quite as complicated as this but i am i think i could do it so well you made the cool um like lens covers for the uh, ball tank didn't you the ball tank the ball tank that he produced the gaddis gaming produced. oh yeah yeah, i did that that was easy that was... yeah well but it's still it looked cool because it was like a yeah. you know like when you have like a headlight on a military vehicle and they put yeah, the cage over cover. the front of it yeah. the grill cover yeah. yeah so you did that that was pretty cool yeah so yeah, yeah. yeah, these will be full vehicles and stuff like that. But oh, you're um, a full vehicle? Yeah, but I'm not wow. coming up with it on my own. So sure, these are sure. some these are some things that were printed um, before um, in other ways that we want to be able to 3D print. So I'm going to kind of be taking uh, basically remodeling it, um, you know, from the re- the like the metal and resin prints that were already mm-hmm. done and and getting them into SDLs that I can use. So. Can you use like a cool 3D scanner or something neat like that? 
I've looked into that stuff and it's I think it's for me it's going to be more work than it's than it's needed like yeah, I think with it, vehicles and stuff like that it's hard to get like with an organic shape it's a different story yeah um, I would totally do it on organic it, yeah. this I'm just like well no because it's all I, I start with a box and then you just kind of take yeah. you know all the stuff away that doesn't look like a tank and then you end up yeah with yeah tank. That's how that's that's basically the, that's the that's the tutorial right there, everybody. <laughs> just make a box and then take away everything that's not the tank. Um, right. Do you are you going to use a Tinkercad or are you going to use something else? No, I'll have to go Tinkercad. I don't think would be able to do as complicated of a shape. Um, mm -hmm. I might do some of the like the parts, some of the like the he's got some of the alternative guns and stuff. Those mm -hmm. might be Tinker, Tinkercad just so I could do them fast. But um, yeah. yeah, I'll be using like a, a probably Fusion three sixty. Gotcha. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that'll be kind of an adventure. Um, so yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, um, and then I've been assembling more and more models um, for kill teams and stuff like that, but I still have yet to put my primer down. Um, I don't know. I can't tell if I'm just uh, gotten to a point where I'm anxious about doing it, or I feel too overwhelmed with all the stuff I now need to prime. Um, um, I mean, sometimes it's just like you're in build mode, you know what I mean? Like you're just like, I'm yeah. just not in the mode to paint. I'm not in the, in the mood to paint. And so you just kind of like, well, yeah. I'll just keep building. So I'm at least being productive in that way. And then when, when you do all of a yeah. sudden get the, the, the Jones mm -hmm. to paint, well, then you got a lot of stuff to paint. Yeah. And I, and like, I, I, I want a regular paint, but I don't want a primer now because I'm going to do the airbrush and I've got to go downstairs because I've been kind of doing like a hobby kit to go and doing stuff, mm -hmm. you know, while we're watching TV at night. With yeah. the wife, so, you know, whereas that I have to kind of like, I'm going to disappear for a couple hours downstairs. And mm -hmm. so I think that's probably why I haven't, like, while I found some time to carve out and do, you know, multitask to do hobbying, I haven't found time to uh, separate myself for a few hours to really get that done. And I kind of want to do as much as I can at once because, you know, cleaning and, and, and clearing out the airbrush and all that stuff isn't a lot of fun. So the less yeah, I mean, times I have to do it. <laughs> that's true. There are times when it's, I mean, it's not too bad, honestly, but it, there are times when like, yeah, if you're just going to be like, I'm going to work on this one model and then you have to work on another model tomorrow night. It seems like it's better to try to do them yeah. both at the same time or whatever. And yeah, it's I know it's in the So it's, I, I just need to do, I'm like, I need a whole bunch of black and then I get to go to gray and then I'll go to white. So mm -hmm. Depending on which I, ones, some, some are getting black, to, black to white. Some are getting black to gray, and some are getting gray to white. So yeah, see that's the thing. I generally don't go three steps with my zenithals. It's generally I go from black to white. But yeah, you're you're doing two steps. You're just using some of them are gray to white, some of them are black to gray. Some right. Are, yeah. So that makes sense. But and I I'm just doing the gray to white way. on the ones that are very white, like uh, mm -hmm. like storm. Mm -hmm. I think the stormtroopers and then some of my towel are like mm -hmm. the main ones that are like. Well, they're mostly white, so doing black is probably just not going to look right. So, honestly, with my stormtroopers, I, I made that video about how to paint stormtroopers, and I just primed them straight white, and then I threw apothecary white contrast paint over the top of them, and then mm -hmm. let it dry, and then I just dry brushed them white again, so that like the big flat panels and stuff like that went back towards white, and mm -hmm. then then it was just painting the parts that need to be black, like the elbows and the knees and the gun and the you know lenses on their face it's 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 a fast quick way to do it you can really get through um a bunch of stormtroopers quickly in that method mm. and you're just priming them white yeah i don't know like if you use the apothecary white then the only other option is i guess is if you use like gray as your base and then a, a real heavy white for the uh zenithal then you probably kind of go from there too but the other option is just yeah. to prime them white and then give them a, a good right. once over with the uh, uh apothecary white contrast paint from games workshop mm. that works well so, yeah, you know, it's different options. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see now that we've watched, you know, you've watched a couple of seasons of The Mandalorian because mm -hmm. The Mandalorian takes place kind of after the Death Star gets blown up, you know, in uh, Return of the right. Jedi and all that kind of stuff. And seeing um, seeing uh, Stormtroopers in, like, rough shape, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Because they're the almost pristine. always... Yeah, like right. in the movie when they're running around on the Death Star and stuff, everything's always really nicely polished. And now you're seeing them like running around on planets and stuff like that. And they're like, they need some work. Like they're grunged up. And I'm like, hey, they kind of look like my uh, my stormtroopers from um, yeah, they're uh, finally weathered. Legion. Yeah, they don't look like yeah, they exactly just got, came off the store shelves. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's I think pretty helpful. That is cool. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, have you been up to anything in the past couple no, weeks? No, I mean not really. No, no, it's yeah. been fine. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I uh, so. Launched a game. I've been talking about this secret project for a while now. 
And mm-hmm. it turns out the secret project was that me and fellow YouTuber, Vince Venturella, Vince uh, Warhammer Weekly Venturella, um, that is not actually his nickname, <laughs> but you know, it's what he's known a lot for uh, online. Uh, he and I have been working on a game, a tabletop skirmish game called Rain in Hell uh, for, well, we started in October, early October, 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, I had had the idea earlier by a good deal. I, it was mm-hmm. banging around in my head since maybe even 2018, but certainly 2019. Um, mm-hmm. he and I, I asked him about whether he would be interested in, in doing it, you know, um, probably I think in September, 2019. And then we kind of talked about it again in February of 2020 and, you know, I'll go over that stuff a little bit later, but yeah. So we launched, um, on, uh, Friday morning, very early. My normal time when my videos go up on Fridays on YouTube is 2 AM central time. And so that's when we launched everything. And, um, and it's, it's gone pretty well. It's been pretty good. Like we, um, the, we we're selling the, the fulfillment is through a company called Wargame Vault, uh, dot com. And they are, uh, part of the one bookshelf family and, uh, we've been selling through them and they have like a little, they've got, you know, they've got drive through RPG, they've got RPG mm-hmm. now they've got drive through comics. They got drive through cars. They got a bunch of different, you know, subsites. And then yeah. this war, wargame, uh, vault.com is another one of those subsites and they, have a little um, bestseller, on, you know, list on every one of those, and so basically, not long after we launched, we were the number one bestseller, and then we've still had it. It's as of today, Tuesday, when we're recording this, it's still there. Um, so that's that's really cool. We've been really really glad. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so um, it's been a ton of work, uh, especially the last couple. Like like early on, it was a lot of um, like me reaching out to illustrators and doing stuff and to art people and doing, you know, figuring out like test runs on, on layout and things like that while Vince was chewing on the rules and really going that because he's more the rules guy, which again, we'll talk about in a bit. But um, yeah, this last uh, two months has been predominantly all in my lap because it's been now it's time to lay it out and get it all nailed down and stuff. So yeah, um, it's been, it's been cool though. And uh, like I said, it's, it's been very well received and it's, it's selling really well and we're really happy about that. It looks fantastic. It's, it's, the rules are fun. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's, it's like I said, it's been, it's, it was something that like, there's a lot of indie games out there and we wanted to make something that maybe didn't look as much like an indie game and maybe didn't mm-hmm. act as much as like an indie game. And like I said, or that's kind of what right. we're going to talk about today, but yeah. It's, yeah. And that was the so thing I, I've, I've seen most from like feedback. People are like, Oh, I finally have a used to use these, you know, X, you know, uh, models and stuff like that versus, you mm-hmm. know, Oh, okay. I need to find more soldiers that I'm going to paint up, you know, Right. And, like and, that. and that's the thing is that this game being uh, miniatures agnostic, which means that miniatures agnostic basically means now some people will be like, oh, that means you can use any miniatures you want. Well, technically, you can use any miniatures you want in pretty much any game, kind of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, again, just like, you know, any pizza is a personal pizza as long as you believe in yourself. Um, <laughs> but it, it's a situation of when, when a game is minis agnostic, what that is, is it's telling you there are no minis for this game. You'll have to figure it out yourself. And, um, so that's kind of a bit of a differentiation. Um, but yeah, it's been cool because it's a game about demons fighting demons. And so there's plenty of demon models out there to use and there's stuff to 3d print, obviously, like that's what we did a lot of for this game so that you could like, so we have the imagery for the, for the game, but you, we're not releasing a line of miniatures. We're not releasing a line of PDF or uh, Mm -hmm. STLs or anything like that. But, um, you know, it's, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, Let's see here. So speaking of that, printing and whatnot, I also started painting a 3D printed and uh, kit bashed uh, model that actually uh, you printed for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it was from uh, a sculptor called Bestarium Miniatures, I believe. And I got it off of Mm -hmm. myminifactory.com. And and I believe the model is called Avatar. And I kit bashed it because he kind of didn't have a head. Like that's sort of the point of him. Like, he kind of looked like a person trapped inside of a tree that was wrapped around him. And then that tree got armor and a sword and then was doing mm-hmm. stuff. And it's a super cool model, but for what it, I'm trying was, to do. Yeah. What, it yeah. was fantastic when I printed it. I was like, Oh, okay. The head's a little like the person kind of coming out of it as the head is a like, okay. But yeah, I, I, I it's like a very the, cool concept, but as a demon, like I looked at it and I'm like, when I, when I first saw it on my mini factory, I'm like, this I'm going to need to put a head on, which is fine. Uh, but I, I liked everything else about it. So yeah, that's when I say it's kit, it printed and kit bashed. It's because I basically, um, games workshop sells a box of skulls 
Uh, and it's a it's a great kit. Like if you're ever looking for skulls to put on like your bases mm-hmm. or whatever, it's a spectacular kit. It's like thirty bucks, but it comes with like three hundred and forty skulls. I was the, thinking, biggest... yeah, the small skulls you will never ever have to buy small skulls ever again in your life. Right, exactly. <laughs> the little the, the biggest skull that's in there is the skull that I used on this guy because he's pretty tall. He's a big mm. dude, and he's on a sixty millimeter base, so he's pretty big. Um, he's going to be the devout uh, for my demented um, uh, cabal. And so he's going to be a madness demon. And nice. so, yeah. So I started painting him. Uh, I primed him and all that stuff before the game launched. And then on Friday morning, like the game launched at like 2 in the morning. And then 10 a.m. I'm on I'm on Twitch. And, um, yeah, and I uh, started painting on him. And um, that's going to be fun. And uh, otherwise, the only other kind of modeling or anything like that that I've had time to do is I have been working slowly on a, a, my first Stargrave crew, Stargrave from Osprey Games. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did work on, so I've already built like five of the like normal models that they sell that you can use. But then I was going to, for my for my captain, actually, I'm using a, uh, a kit bashed kind of thing where I've used, um, I'm using... Um, like Imperial Guard models, like an Imperial okay. Guard model, like so the Cadians, but then I'm using the a female head from one of the Stargrave kits. And the Stargrave uh-huh. kits are a little bit, not everybody's so thick. You know what I mean? Like if you go back and look at the Cadians, you look at the, the Imperial Guard, they are very heroically scaled, which is to say right. their, wrist, their wrists are the size of like a normal person's thighs and stuff like that. Like they're very, very thick yes. folks. Yeah, they, they're not uh, want for any meals. For any meals. Right, yeah, exactly. And um, they're just very stout, which is fine. So um, I used the legs and the torso from Acadian, and then I used arms from the regular one of the regular Stargrave kits and then a Stargrave kind of female head. And because the head's smaller than the body a little bit, kind of noticeably, it looks like a woman wearing like kind of like thick like armor kind of almost, you know, like, but underneath her outfit, oh, like, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah, kind of yeah. like when you see a, a police officer and they're wearing the big thick vest underneath and they got right. that, that big sort of barrel torso. Um, it's kind of like that. And it worked out actually surprisingly well. So uh, her, her, her character, she's a veteran. Like, cause when you pick your captain, you can pick like a, a an archetype, you know, captain or, a, you know, like a veteran, a rogue, a, you know, a, a robot technician, like all kinds of different things. And then sure. that kind of d- drives how your thing works. So, yeah, so I'm going to make it that she's a veteran of the big war that basically screwed up the whole galaxy and stuff and whatnot. And um, so that she's got a bit of a military uniform on. She's obviously wearing armor. I gave her a little mini grenade launcher, which I think technically is supposed to be a shotgun, but I tweaked it a little bit. Um, Mm. So, yeah, all that kind of stuff. It's a lot of fun. But I've worked on her a little bit, not this weekend because I was busy all weekend, but last weekend. So I got that uh, going. So that's basically about it. That's that's about it. Not much really going on. (laughs) <laughs> well good i'm yeah. glad you got, you've, you've got a lot of free time on your hands yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> so the topic of today's uh video is to kind of talk a little bit about um and i think there might be people out there that are interested to kind of know a little bit about um diy tabletop games we've done a video we we, we t- or not a video we did a, a podcast where we talked with uh lee from gaddis gaming about how mm-hmm. to get into you know making your own game but in that we were talking right. about like plastic you know molding and tooling and And metal yeah yeah a lot Mm -hmm. of different stuff and in this we're going to talk a little bit about more kind of indie diy stuff so it's not so much it's like you know it's a it's a kind of a smaller game but you know what's available for you to to do and how how is it available for you to do it Mm -hmm. um you know producing an indie game is as diy as possible is actually far for the most part, it's far, far easier than it used to be. Um, this is not my first rodeo because uh, my good friend Peter Spejos and I uh, had a game company, like a little hobby press game company back in the early 90s, um, which was called Snarling Badger Games. Me and Vince, our company is now called Snarling Badger Studios. So you can totally see the difference there. Um, you just didn't but, want a second tattoo. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Cause the logo has been a tattoo of mine for a while now. And so, cause I designed the logo and I'm like, well, we get, and I already had, I've had the domain name now for a quarter of a century. So I'm like, I'm, you know, I don't want to change my email address. That's so. right. That'd be so, crazy. um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was a situation of, um, back when Peter and I were doing this, we were making games that we would have to get printed like locally. Mm-hmm. Um, our first game that we ever produced was a game called battle bots. This is long before the battle bots 
TV show with the robot or the remote control, you know, cars basically smashing into each other and all that kind of stuff. Um, And we made this game BattleBots. It was gladiatorial robot combat. And we printed it at our local Kinko's and packaged 24 copies and put them inside CD cases. So there was no CD in there. We would take out the, the insert part. So it was just the clear part. And then we mm-hmm. everything we printed was the size to fit into side CD cases, and then we would slide it in there. And then we even okay. just put like a p- piece of like colored tape to keep it closed because we didn't even have them shrink wrapped because you know. And we were literally putting it together the night before Gen Con, and then we like, got done. How, how long did it take to do those twenty four? You think? Uh we got to Kinko's probably around six or seven p.m. and we watched the sun come up because this is back when Kinko's was twenty four hours. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, we we worked. Yeah, we did the whole thing and everything. And it was not just a book. It was like a book, and there was a couple of maps, and there was like little cutouts to make like little standees, almost, you know, for your bots mm. and all that kind of stuff. Because it was kind of, I don't want to say it was a miniatures game. It was like a, a little bit of a gateway game, but it mm-hmm. was um, it was a little miniaturesy, a little bit. And um, yeah, and there was even tiny five millimeter dice that we put into the uh, uh, into the, the the CD case, so you had dice ready to go. You shouldn't use them because you you know sneeze and you're going to lose them. They're really really tiny, but um, it, we still put them in there. And um, so yeah, and then we took it to Gen Con and sold it. Uh, there was a, a company, there was a store, I think out of West Dallas, Wisconsin, which is in a, a suburb to Milwaukee. And this is back when Gen Con was in Milwaukee, and it's also back when Gen Con was like maybe only sixteen thousand people. These days, it's seventy thousand. And uh, so we paid that guy like twenty five bucks to put our games in his booth, like where he was selling stuff from his store. And then we went up into the free area, the free gaming area, and would just run demos. And then we would tell people, like you know, we would have this little sheet that was kept all the stats for your bot. On the back of each one, we would write, you know, go to booth whatever, and you can buy the game. And uh, we did eventually. On the last day of the convention, sell two copies. I still to this day believe that it was the store owner feeling sorry for us. And he like, because we would show up after like, you know, just before the hall would close, the 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 dealer hall would close on, you know, and we would like poke our head in there. And he'd be like, yeah, no, nobody bought it today. And like, that's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday we came to pick up our stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, no, someone came and bought two copies. And I was just like, I, later on, you know, as you get older, you're like, I think that he just bought those two copies to, because he felt bad because we gave him 25 bucks. Um, but anyway, it was a lot, it was hard. It was hard to get that stuff out the door and to see, you know, get people to see it and all that kind of stuff. And in this day and age of social media and, you know, podcasts and like instant communication and all that kind of stuff and print on demand and PDFs, like there were no PDFs in 1992 when we made that game. Like we couldn't even produce it that way. That was not a thing. You know what I mean? Um, but now it is, uh, it's easier to do. And so that's really, really good. I think I lost him. Uh, all right. I think that we're back. Um, yeah. <laughs> Matt's house lost power while we were recording and I was just yammering on and didn't realize and stuff. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that this is, uh, yeah, I think we're back together. Everything's fine over by you now, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. There's nobody driving through fields anymore. There's no more fire trucks going by. Yeah. I have no, like for a little bit there, I was uh, starting to worry that Mark Wahlberg was going going to run by and tell me that uh i needed to run away from trees so because the trees are trying to kill you right like, yeah it's a it's, it's about the the, uh, the movie the happening which almost nobody saw in case you're wondering um so anyway i was talking about um being diy back in the day and all that kind of stuff and how um nowadays it is far easier to do this kind of stuff mm-hmm. because of you know, your um, PDFs and your, uh, you know, different companies that that, that that kind of allow you to do that kind of stuff and whatever and print on demand and all that stuff. But mm-hmm. on the other hand, it's also far harder, again, because the market's so dense. There's so many people out there. I mean, back uh, when yeah. we were doing it, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of people doing it. And even if there were, you couldn't find half of them anyway. So, you know, it was kind of right. hard. But now it's very easy to produce the content. There's a lot of tools at your at your disposal. But now there's lots and lots and lots and lots of other people who are doing it. So right, because it, be yeah. it became easier for everybody, not just you. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the whole concept of becoming a, like a, doing a DIY type of game or a, a super indie kind of game like that, it's it's much easier of the four genres. It is far easier to do it with RPGs and mm-hmm. uh, tabletop miniature war game rule sets. 
and it's a lot harder to do. Not a lot harder, but it's a, it's a good deal harder to do with board games. And I think it's very, very harder. Uh, very, very, very harder. I think it's very hard to do it with collectible card games. Um, for board games, there's a company that's actually based out here in Wisconsin uh, called The Game Crafter. Mm-hmm. And um, they allow you to upload files. And it's a basically print-on-demand board game company. And they can also do cards as well. So if you're looking for like a card game, like not a collectible card game, but like, you know, here's a deck of cards Mm -hmm. or something like that, a living card game, whatever. Like when they first started, the boxes were all like white boxes with a sticker on it. But now like they can make like nice graphic wrapped boxes with a top and a bottom. And and you can get like tuck boxes for your cards. And they have zillions of different types of like plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Components. And components. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they print really good cards now and they print really good boards and things like that. So you can do it. It's not cheap. Like if you're trying to make even a little bit of profit. Um, you, you, uh, you know, it, the, these, these games are going to be pretty expensive to produce and ship and all that kind of stuff, but they are yep. produced one at a time. So it's a situation where you can come up with a concept and put it out there and then, you know, and then if you can market it and get people to, to come buy it. I mean, there have been a couple of games that have gone quite well that I can think of, and I'm not even really a board gamer. I mean, one of the biggest ones I can think of is cause I actually own it is a, it's a, it's a game from that's now being produced by Calliope games. And I think it's called let's roll. Mm-hmm. or yep. roll for it it's either let's roll or roll, roll for it uh roll for oh now mm, now I'm i've confused. You know, sowed some i've sowed some uh some yep. discontent. yeah um it, but anyway it's a it's basically a dice game but it's a it's also got some cards in it too and stuff like that and it was originally from what i understand it was originally produced on um on game crafter and then eventually uh calliope games reached out to the designers and was like hey and then another big one is actually uh, a game called the captain is dead which also mm-hmm. started on um, um, Game, Crafter. Game Crafter. And I believe JT uh, Smith, I believe that JT Smith, he's the one, he's one of the guys who runs Game Crafter, basically. And he's also, I think, partial partial designer on The Captain is Dead, so that helps. But then they mm-hmm. got picked up by, I believe, AEG. So, you know, it, it, can, it's, it can be something you use for prototyping. It can be something you use, you know, out there for whatever, you know, or even just to, to direct sell. It's just a little harder kind of to go down that road. And like I said, a little bit more expensive. Um, collectible card games, I've never seen any actual good solution for an indie collectible card game. Um, yeah. Other than maybe something online. Like if you've seen games like Hearthstone, things like that. But then we're not talking about tabletop games. You know what I mean? So as far right. as an actual tabletop game, there's not really ever anything I've seen out there that would work well for like you get a random set of cards and oh some are mm-hmm. rare and some are not and all that kind of stuff. So that's really not a, within the indie purview, you know what I mean? Yeah, not at least not yet. I mean, when you yeah, look no, at absolutely. Like, like some of the stuff that they're able to do now with um oh shoot, what's the card game that we like? Uh, uh key something Keystone Keyforge. no. Keyforge, Keyforge, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah Keyforge I mean, look- is cool because it's each deck is digitally printed and they're digitally printed differently, so that like the backs yeah. are all different. And so, so yeah, I mean, that's- when you're looking at stuff like that, you're like, okay, it's probably just a matter of time before, or you know, you get there. Well, and it's if, also if a little- the demand's there. Yeah, exactly. If the demand's there, but it's also something to do with like the way that they wrote that game was that the game the, the cards aren't tradable, like. You get a deck. Right. There you go. So that's like that's a big difference. Like I can't be like, oh, I need this single and I need this single and I, then this is a really right. rare single. It's not the way that the game works. It's that the deck is thirty six cards and each deck is different, and you can't swap cards between decks because the backs right. of each of the cards is unique and it has right. like the name of the you know the main character who is the deck on there and all that kind of stuff. So if you rewrite the rules, it's still a collectible card game. It's just not what we think of when we think of magic. Well, Pokemon, but I think what I so from what I've read from like industry people, they're just like I you know the fact that they can do that tells mm-hmm. you that they're doing something different than what how you know how like you know magic and all of them are where they're doing the big boards of you know cards and then cutting them up. They're doing something more dynamic in their print process so that there that a lot of other people have not figured out exactly how they're able to do it yet i mean i if i had to guess and this is just me pulling this out of my backside uh if i had to guess so like normally cards are printed in a 54 card block so it's like a big honking sheet right like a huge proof sheet and there's 54 cards and then they go ka-chunk and they print it and they cut them all out and there you go 50 i'm assuming these yeah six. 54 56 56 i thought it was 54 no, two jokers and then two advertisement cards. Oh, yeah. Seven, eight. Seven by Either eight. Either way. 
But um, yep. this ga- this deck is 36. So I'm assuming they're just doing it on a slightly smaller paper, you know, like a smaller stock. And then they're still punching it out the same way and they're just producing it. And then that way the back is being, well, the back and the front are probably being digitally printed and then they just go chunk and then, you know, you're done. So they're doing it that way, I'm assuming. And it's just a smaller press and that's why it's yeah. 36 cards instead of 54. I'm not sure, but... Um, Something like that is is occurring, but the fact that the computer, because they're they keep talking about how it's procedurally generated and all this kind of right. stuff, again, you're changing the rules a good deal, you know, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with changing the rules. The one of the reasons we like the game is because it's not a deck building game. You can get your deck, mm-hmm. and your deck is your deck, you know, um, and so that's pretty cool. So yeah, like I said, there's you know you could do a you could do a PDF board game where you just expect the person to print and play and put do it all themselves. Right. You know, there are a lot of people out there who are like, yeah, I'm not interested in printing and playing, but there are also people who are, who are like, you know what, for uh, an inexpensive price and then me doing my kind of the construction mm-hmm. and stuff like that, I dig it. And then there's Game Crafter, which kind of like splits the difference there and is, you know, uh, print on demand mm-hmm. stuff and giving you, you know, options. But obviously if you're playing, if you're making a game about robot squirrels, they probably don't have plastic robot squirrel, you know, figures that they, that you could use, but they have, plastic spaceships, you know, or plastic rocket ships or plastic or plastic squirrels. Know, they might have plastic pawns. squirrels. They might have points. squirrels to be fair. Maybe not robot squirrels. That's a good point. But anyway, so so that's kind of important. Um and and, and sometimes you end up changing the way that your game kind of is played so that it has to do with what's what's available and what's possible within the DIY realm. DIY realm. Back in the day when my friend Peter and I had our game company <clears throat> And we were going around to different small conventions. We would have people who would walk up and be like, so I got this game idea. It's going to be really cool. So there's 500 cards and uh, <laughs> the board is a uh, six foot by six foot. You know, you're just like, all right, well, already you're making it very difficult for you to produce this yourself. Um, right. And and the reason kind of that you sort of need to produce things yourself is it's it's not a situation where you can just walk up to Hasbro and be like, look, I got this idea for a game because they don't care. That's not their, right. They've got the, people that they pay to make games that yeah, will make them money. It's just like, yeah, we build mobile apps and people come to us all the time like, hey, I've got an idea for a mobile app. If you build it for me, I'll cut you in on some of the profit. And it's like, <laughs> right. Yeah. The lack of ideas is not where I struggle. It's the, mm-hmm. it's the time and the money that's really the, the, the stuff. And the same with Hasbro and all of them. They, they could go produce, you know, 10,000 board games a, a, a year mm-hmm. if you know if everything else being equal you know was cheap yeah, yeah exactly it's not, they're not sitting there going man i wish we had an idea for a board game we are out we're completely out of ideas no that's never the case the situation is always you know looking at it from the aspect of is it going to sell that kind of stuff especially when you're a big company right. like that when you're indie you might you're very frequently doing it for passion it's very frequently a passion project right. the stuff that that uh, you know that that uh, vince and i've worked on this game here arena and hell has been we, something we just wanted to do um you know so um yeah, anyway, to talk a little bit about that. So Vince and I uh, have known each other for a while. Vince is a YouTuber. I'm a YouTuber. We're both into miniatures. We would talk to each other at conventions and stuff like that and uh, and whatever. And um, I knew he had a background in, in game design. Uh, he had designed several of his own games. And he'd also worked as a like paid consultant on D&D 5th Edition and a bunch of other stuff. And so I had this idea for a game, but I'm not great at the math and the mechanics Uh, so I reached out to him at one point when we were hanging out with a friend of ours, um, back in September of like 2019. And I said, Hey, I got this idea and I think, you know, would you be interested? And he was like, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. And then time went by and then it was early 2020, just before the pandemic is February. And he was in town visiting and, uh, we were out at dinner as him and I, and my friend, Sam, our friend, Sam, and, um, and yeah, and it was just a situation of, you know, again, bringing it up and then the pandemic and everything was, you know, pandemic-y. Mm-hmm. And uh, in about October, <laughs> early October, I just reached out to him online and I was like, you know, you're still, I'm, I'm still thinking about this. Are you interested? And he said, yeah. And then we started meeting um, online. We had weekly online meetings like during the pandemic because we weren't going anywhere. We weren't traveling or anything like that because <laughs> um, he did, generally travels a good deal for his job. And we both like to go to conventions and stuff like that. So uh, none of that was going on. So we were just every pretty much Thursday night, we were meeting on, online and, and going over stuff. And um, and it was a situation of just figuring out, like I already knew that I wanted to do a game with demons. And again, talking about 
tweaking your design to fit your capabilities. The reason I wanted to do a game about demons is because I wanted to make a miniatures agnostic game. I didn't want to make a game that had an, an included, you know, um, miniatures line because that's hard. Right. You have to find sculptors and all that stuff. It's a pain um, and it's expensive. But I knew there's plenty of people out there who make demon miniatures already, you know, whether it mm -hmm. is companies like Games Workshop or Mantic or, um, you know, weird games with Malifaux. There's plenty of models in there that can be demons. Um, I know there's demons that have been released for Frostgrave. You know, there's all kinds of different companies. Plus, then you get into 3D printing. Right. The, yeah, the thousands of Patreons out there. Yeah, absolutely. Like I went through, um, I just went, poked my head into um, myminifactory.com and just typed demon into the uh, like search bar on it and just started finding all these amazing STLs. And that's where I got a lot of the starters. The, the stuff that you, if you do see the book, there's a lot of artwork in the book that is um, photographs of printed models that have, that, that have either been painted by myself or by Vince. And then we worked with a guy we found online who could then take those photos where they were basically just taken against a white background and then paint yeah. in a really super cool background of hell and smoky clouds and grit and, and all kinds yeah. of stuff. I remember when yeah. you, like, cause you, I, you saw me, you showed me like the originals. I was like, Oh yeah, this came out cool. And then you're like, and here's what this guy did. And I'm like, Holy cow! I didn't like. Yeah. I would not even have known that was the same thing. Like, oh, absolutely. They look like they don't look like photographs. Like when he's done, it's his uh, no. artists artistsempire dot com, and also he has a YouTube channel and all that stuff. Twitch or not Twitch, um, uh, Twitter. Um, yeah. But yes, Scott at that at the, he he does amazing, astounding work, and so we were glad to find him. And mm -hmm. so we knew that being able to find these types of things, like you know, again, there's the robot squirrel problem. If the game would have been about robot squirrels fighting robot squirrels, well, now you have to try to figure out where to find robot squirrel models as the person who buys the game. When we right. say, look, this game is about demons. Not only are there lots of companies that make demons the way maybe we think about demons, but a lot of different cultures think about demons in different ways. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that makes it even easier. Um, you know, and then it also helps for the artwork as well, not just that kind of photography thing and then having the paint overs, but also there are a lot of woodcuts out there, like old timey woodcuts, which are no longer covered by, you know, uh, copyright mm. uh, of demons, you know, like they, people, there's a lot of woodcuts out there with demons and skeletons in it. That's what they, they focused on on that a lot, a lot back in the day, you know, and also knights yeah. and things like that right. and whatever. And so you can find those things online and uh, they also worked out well. And I knew I wanted kind of like almost a bit of a, kind of a heavy metal, but not like, not like eighties heavy metal, but more like today's heavy metal, which is again, goes back and uses a lot of like woodcuts and things like that because they're, you know, public domain and, uh, and uh, very frequently they're, um, they're pretty cool, you know, they're pretty metal, they're mm -hmm. pretty, um, dark. And so that kind of stuff, that's, that's what we wanted to do. So again, planning ahead and thinking about like, what am I going to be able to do? Because games, unless they're completely, um, abstract are going to have some sort of theme, but if you make the theme really crazy difficult to get art assets for or to get, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, uh, you have to think about that stuff ahead of time. You can get, you can save yourself so many uh, headaches by just thinking ahead. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then we knew it was going to be something we were going to produce as a PDF. And we also knew we wanted to do print on demand. And, okay. Um, yep. And we thought at the time, the plan was, is that we were going to do it all ourselves. So there's, I mean, obviously we weren't going to do the print on demand ourselves. We don't have that kind of facility, mm -hmm. but there are companies out there, um, a company called lulu.com, which we were planning on going with for the print on demand. And then we were going to, for the PDF, we were going to produce the PDF ourselves, which is what we did. But then we were also going to be able to like, there are services you can go through like Shopify and this and that and the other thing where you can buy a thing and it'll send a file to somebody and it's kind of automated, but it kind of takes a couple of plugins to make it work right and all this kind of stuff. Okay. And so it was a lot of like initially early on, the idea was, here's the thing, companies like uh, Wargame Vault, which okay. is the partner we ended up going with, uh, they are uh, an overall company that's owned by uh, One Bookshelf is the name of the overall company. So if you've ever heard of Drive Through RPG or RPG Now or Drive Through Comics or Drive Through Cards or War Game Vault, Deals it's all the same killed. company. Yep. Yeah, exactly. All the same company. And basically, they take 30%. So if you sell a game for $10 as a PDF, they will take 3 bucks. which initially I was like, well, no, I can do all that stuff. But honestly, it's really kind of hard. Like it's a ton of work to do all that stuff that they do yourself. Um, one of the biggest benefits is that they deal with all of the online transactions and all that kind of stuff and potential chargebacks mm -hmm. and this and that and the other thing. Somebody loses their laptop with their PDF on it and it goes into the ocean. I don't know why, but let's say it does. 
Well, now that person gets a new laptop and now they're contacting us and saying, hey, I need to re-download my PDF of your game and I have to prove that they have to prove that they bought it from us and blah, 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 and all this stuff. Through a company like One Bookshelf, they just log into their account and re-download it. It's just way easier. Right. Yeah. So they, they, look, they do the watermark PDF. So like if someone leaks exactly. it online, you know exactly whose it is. That did yes, it. exactly. And we wanted to make sure we had that as well. I mean, it's not infallible. Hackers can right. strip that out. I get that. But for the average Joe, it's it's not bad. Um, and then they also work very closely with the uh, print on demand thing. And I like their print on demand stuff. The quality was good. I had purchased things from them before print on demand and was pretty happy with the quality. So, um, you know, I mean, it was one of those situations where we were like, look, it's, this is just going to work best if we go with these guys and sure that they take 30%, but honestly, that's, that's fine. Um, and they do have a marketplace where people who maybe don't know Vince nor I through YouTube, um, right. will look at it and go see us maybe, you know, somewhere on the listing somewhere. I mean, currently we're on the bestseller list. And so they look at it and go, oh, I don't, that's cool. I'll, I'll check that out. And so you end up even being able to get some reach to people who have never heard of you if you are, you know, a, a, a YouTube nerd or whatever along those lines. Right. Um, we, we, we had people ask why we didn't use Kickstarter. And uh, I actually, in the video that I did on my channel where I, you know, when we launched the, the game, uh, I actually made a joke about how we are, and we're really super glad to bring it to you on Kickstarter in a couple of months. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We're not. We're not doing Kickstarter. It's available right now. There's nothing wrong with Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter is great for small groups that are trying to make something and they need the money up front, otherwise they can't make it. What you're seeing a lot in the industry right now is Kickstarter is just basically being used as a marketing tool. So you've got big, huge companies producing something that they're they're going to produce anyway, but there's a Kickstarter about it, and then it's a thing, and oh, they hit their gold. And, they hit their goal in 26 seconds or whatever the deal is and that kind of right. stuff, you know, and we looked at it also from doing the kind of DIY thing. We're like, the only thing we're going to spend money on is artwork, you know, like that's now, should we have spent some money on a professional copywriter or a copy reader, uh, a copy editor? Yes. Yes, we should have. Uh, and that will be uh, happening uh, going forward. Um, and we've actually already got uh, a person now. And so we'll be, um, you know, updating the, the PDFs and all that kind of stuff um, with all the new, uh, you know, and again, there's not really any, there's, there's really only two like errors that are slightly impactful to the way the game is played. Otherwise right. it's spelling and grammatical Which shenanigans. I think is still pretty darn good. Cause I, I, you know, I, I could name quite a few games off the top of my head that, have had at least that many in V1, you know, that I got. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's true. I mean, we're also, you know, two guys with day jobs. So there's that too, but it's still, it's an, it's, we don't like it. And so, um, mm -hmm. next game, and we do plan on doing more games. Uh, next game will be definitely, you know, we'll have all that. I, I it, we'll have a professional take a look at it and everything. It'd be great. Um, so, you know, but we just didn't see the point to going through Kickstarter. I get, I have an issue with Kickstarter sometimes, and then it just like I, I get tired of waiting for a really long time. And even though we had this done, we could have done a Kickstarter and then just literally like within three weeks after the Kickstarter, just been like, boom, there you go. But right. and, and shipped it out or whatever. But we just didn't see the point. Um, so, again, well, there's not, another another company that would have taken a percentage, too. Right. Yeah. No, that's actually a very good point. That's very true. I mean, if we would have been doing it that way. I mean, the, but yeah, you know, I mean, there's so many different things. I, I think that if you're, especially if you're dipping your toe, if you're interested in getting into game design and everything like that, mm -hmm. skipping, you know, Kickstarter and all that kind of stuff, just producing your game, putting it out into War Game Vault mm -hmm. or Drive Through RPG or whomever along those lines, um, or even just trying to sell, if you want to just sell it direct through your own website, you can totally do that as well. That's fine. But it's a situation of just trying to figure that out. And understanding that doing it that way, you know, you're not going to necessarily knock it out of the park on the first try. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a situation where you will, you know, you maybe you produce the first game and then you learn things. I mean, we've already learned plenty of things, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but yeah, the understanding that like you learn a lot more by doing that way, at least. I don't know. I think it's I think it's great because if you do it right, it doesn't really barely cost you anything to produce your own game and get it out there and then maybe start to build a, a, a you know, a community around it. Right. So, yeah. Very cool. So, so advantages that we had. Now, I, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm putting this out there and I'm telling you folks a little bit right. about kind of like the story about it, but um, right. So one, like if you did it versus like, say, like even me, I think you've got, mm -hmm. you had advantages. 
Sure, sure. So some of the relatively simple advantages are that I mean, Vince has done a bunch of video or a bunch of game design, tabletop di- design before, mm-hmm. um, like I mentioned earlier, and I've done some as well. You know, like that the me mm-hmm. and my friend Peter, um, and we had done so. I we both kind of had our toes already dipped into that water in some fashion. Um, right. The other thing is that Vince is the one who is like good at math and mechanics and game design mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff, whereas well, I'm he, more. He breaks yeah. down like Vince breaks down a lot of the rules like for Warhammer and stuff like that, right? Like, oh yeah, if you go watch the Warhammer Weekly on every Wednesday over on Vince Ventrella's YouTube channel, which you totally should, especially if you're into Age of Sigmar, because that's his main kind of you know th- mm-hmm. thrust of the of the that part of the of his channel. The other thrust of his channel is all painting tutorials and stuff. But on Wednesdays, he does a live show every week, and they talk about um, the game of Age of Sigmar, and very frequently mm-hmm. they will take a look at rules. And take a look at you know um, battle tomes and armies and deconstruct them and figure out a better way to do it you know and say well it should be like this or this and that so right. strategically he's he's way further ahead than I am which is great mm-hmm. um, and that's that you need somebody like that um, but you also need somebody like me in there as well um, because I'm more conceptual and I'm layout and graphics and art director which is the stuff that Vince says that he hates like like I said he's done games before. Um, he's even done some Kickstarters back in the day for some RPG stuff. But the mm-hmm. issue is he writes everything and then has to figure out how to get somebody else potentially to do the layout or he has to end up doing it himself. And he's, you know, there were horror stories that he told me about. And uh, when you're not, you know, wired for that, like I'm not really wired for the strategic stuff. He's not really wired for the art stuff. And so to have a partner in this mm-hmm. situation, if you can, is a great thing. If you can come up with a great game idea and you can even come up with a great game the text, all the stuff, and you play yep. tested it. You did all this stuff. It can be very still difficult to get people to buy it if it looks like a Word document. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So, and, and, yeah. The 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 level of expectations that people have now from even like when you were do, doing your CD copies, like absolutely. if you went and did your, your CD copy like jewel cases now, mm-hmm. it it might be pretty hard for anyone, especially if they didn't know who you were, to buy sure. a copy. Sure. Absolutely. Um, versus if you like go and it looks nice and polished, you know, and I think about like when I go to like conventions or anything, and if I see something that looks nice and polished and they've got good layout presentation, I usually stop and like, okay, what's going on here? But if it looks very like put, you know, very DIY and stuff, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, well, I, I've got enough games. I don't know if I really need a game that much. And that's the trick these days, unfortunately, a little bit. And and it, it's just a, it's just a, a situation of human nature. You can mm-hmm. go DIY, you know, but you may need to find somebody, whether it's maybe a spouse or a good friend, or again, like if you start a partnership with somebody like me and Vince are doing, it's really helpful to get something right. so that you've got somebody who's good at the visuals. And they don't even have to be mm-hmm. the artist. Like I did very little of the art in this. I did a couple little tiny illustrations and stuff. For the most part, the art was all, I was the art director on, on right. a lot of this. Um, whereas, you know, and so that was, it, it's helpful to have somebody who can be, who can do that well. And then if you want, because people, it's the shiny syndrome. People are walking around maybe at a, at a convention or they're like, you know, looking through the different covers uh, of the different games on, you mm-hmm. know, like say a place like, uh, working fault and you're going to be like oh that's a cool cover what's that all about and you're going to read it and go oh yeah it's not for me maybe but you might also someone else hits that and looks and they're like that sounds interesting i'll buy that you know right it, the cover just like on uh, um netflix like thumbnail mm-hmm. is super important like that that thing that you see as you're flipping through um you know uh netflix and also even youtube i mean that the thumbnail and the right. title are some of the most important things Absolutely. that you can do for your video it's the same type of deal so um, having the ability to do that, but still do it in the DIY situation, nobody expects like a huge, crazy, like games workshop level or mm-hmm. Asmo Day level, uh, you know, cover artwork, but they do want something that looks kind of cool. And if you can find somebody who does work that's pretty good or close to that, then, you know, uh, that's awesome. Um, but that's where certainly in a lot of these games, that's where a lot of the money goes up front if you do have to do some sort of you know, Kickstarter or whatever, a lot of the money goes towards layout and, and, and art. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, but it, it's something that can be done. And we were, we, we, you know, we bought, we paid artists for the stuff, but we just 
that came out of our pockets and we knew that, you know, that that was going to be a good idea. Um, but we play off each other pretty well that way. Not only are we both kind of having our own areas of, of expertise within this, it's also a situation of us just being able to like iterate really well and kind of be like, well, what do you think about this? Okay, well, let's do that, you know, and that kind of stuff. Mm. And it works out pretty well. Um, now the big thing, of course, that has given us a definite advantage uh, in selling this game over the last, well, it's been out at this point, not even quite a week. Uh, a big advantage of it is, of course, that it, both Vince and I have been building up YouTube communities, um, et cetera, mm. not just YouTube, but also Instagram and Twitter and all that kind of stuff for right. like nearly a decade, each of us. Like I've technically been on YouTube for 10 years because I started off working with the folks from Beasts of War. So mm -hmm. like in 2010. So yeah, it's been going for a while and we've been building that. So a person who sits down to write a really super cool game and maybe even has some pretty cool layout, when you get that up and launched on a place like RPG Now, Drive Through RPG, whatever, it, you know, you now have a, a pretty steep hill to climb to get your marketing message out in front of people in, like I said earlier, a pretty dense market. There's a lot of people out there who are doing this kind of stuff, right. this kind of DIY. So it's difficult with us. Like I said, between the two of us, we've got like, I don't know if you count some overlap, like I've got about a uh, 196,000 subscribers and I think Vince is a 62 or 63,000 yeah, subscribers. Like that. Yep. And so between the two of us, we also understand there's a bunch of overlaps. So let's just be super conservative and say there's two, 200,000 folks, you know, that's still right. a decent sized market that you can kind of advertise mm -hmm. to. And, and, you know, so, so building a, you know, maybe your first game is your first game, but then you start to build a small community and you start to do stuff on YouTube or Instagram or Twitter and you build an mm -hmm. audience like trying to go in it without any audience. It's doable. It's just not it's you're, you're it's not going to sell climb. a lot. It's right. a super uphill climb. It, so, it's like a movie coming out. That's why like a lot of your movie trailers are like, oh, from the producers of blah, 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 blah. Exactly. Or exactly. The director of this. It's like, oh, you know, you might. It might have nothing to do with it, but they're just like, oh, we're going to try to like go, well, we're trying to try to reuse some of that audience of people, you know, and, and yeah. instead of starting from scratch. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I suspect that there's probably some people out there that are like, well, that's not fair because they're YouTubers and whatever. But like, again, it's, we, we spent eight and a half years at least, if not more, you know, putting this together and uh, not the game, mm -hmm. but the building the audience. So sure. Right. Like, you know, if, if we had started yesterday and somehow got a, a massive audience, it would be, yeah, no, but it, we just, it, it takes a ton of work to get the audience. And then once you get the audience, then it's time to start saying, Hey, look, we made this thing or whatever. Um, and then, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not like it's an overnight thing. This has been something that not even just the game, the game took, I don't know, eight months to, to write and, and right. produce, but the building the audience took a lot longer than that. Right. So and that's not like you just sit down and hit record and your 12 minute video is done in 12 minutes. There's right. Exactly. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it, it is, you know, it's not necessarily for everybody, but if you like creation, as long as you understand that, yeah, you're, you're going to ha have to work hard to get, your product kind of known in the marketplace to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. but you just love creating stuff. Like that's the whole kind of essence of DIY is just the love of creation. Um, you know, Vince and I are not going to retire on, on the money that we're making from this. Cause we're just, we're selling it cheap, you know, and, and, but it, the, the, the main benefit right now is at least then we'll, we won't have to dip into our own money to basically pay for our work and stuff like that for the next game. You know, I mean, it'll, so it's, right. You know, so it, that that's good. And and that's the thing is we're also a big benefit. I think that we had was we're advantages that we we didn't spend much and we did keep the game small game. The game's only 64 pages. I was talking with Vince yesterday and he's like, mm -hmm. we should just make all of our games 64 pages because this is a lot of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And and right. I was thinking about it at the time. I'm like, well, I, I don't know about that. But honestly, you know, the Osprey Blue Books, mm -hmm. you know, like the like like Gaslands, the old Gaslands before they made right. the, the expansion. Um, yeah, how many and, is that? Uh, I've heard, and I guess I haven't sat down to look at them all. Uh, I've got Zona Alpha right here next to me, which is another one of their blue books. Um, yeah. I believe all of the blue books are 64 pages, not 60 oh. pages, not 68 pages, because you have to go in, you know, multiples of four. They're all like, it's it's almost like they've got a press set up to run these and they, it only does so many pages or I don't know what the deal is or that's where they figured out the sweet spot is for the profit or whatever. But evidently yeah. all of these blue books are 64 pages and they're all the same oh. size and they kind of have almost even the same format. And so, you know, thinking about that is something as well. Um, 
uh, I think it's an advantage that it worked out pretty well for us. Uh, well, and I think you guys also did a good job of like, you know, setting your expectations too. Like you didn't go, well, we're going to release this and um, I'm going to go ahead and put um, a pre-order in on my Lamborghini for next week. And <laughs> right, right. No, absolutely. <laughs> contact my Lear jet uh, representative. And Yeah, there's not really any f- fear of that having to be a problem in tabletop gaming. As we've said many <laughs> times here on the uh, on, on the podcast before, um, the, the joke, uh, how do you make a small fortune in tabletop? games and the answer is start with a large fortune so it's not necessarily a a money making uh uh, it's not a smart money making move necessarily but if you enjoy doing it and you're willing to work i mean honestly yeah you can you can produce a game and now you're going to have to work even doubly hard to market it and get people interested because there's so many in the market but um there's there's so many different th- ways that you can like reach out to illustrators on Instagram. There's so many different ways you can find people. Yeah. Like it used to be really hard to find illustrators and to find layout people right. and all that. You'd kind have of to stuff. put like a little thing in your, you know, like I don't know, newspaper or magazine article. Or well, there used to be. I used stores. to see stuff in like, um, oh, like like different gaming magazines. There'd be stuff in the back. They'd be like, "Hey, we're looking for an illustrator for this game" or that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and almost like uh, like classified ads, you know. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot easier to do that these days. But there's also, well, I mean, there's also a lot of work out there too. So for some folks, they're you're not able to get that person because they are swamped with their own work right now. Mm. Because it's a lot easier for people to to be able to produce this stuff. So, yeah, I think that it's uh, it's one of those situations where, like, again, I think we had um, a, a a decent amount of advantages. So we were we were glad for that, and it kind of seemed like the right time to do it. Right. Um, as far as promoting the game, I mean, besides yeah, our so YouTube like, channels, else, right? So instead of yeah, so yeah, so outside of like just your social community and stuff like that, like what are some other ways that you did it that people could go? Well, I could probably do that. Like I know you did you did press releases, right? Or yeah, we we created a press release, and we'll be creating more. But we created a launch press release, and we built a list of different. YouTube's webs- or YouTube channels and podcasts and websites and just different places that talked about the type of game that we were producing. So if you're uh, writing an RPG book, you're obviously going to talk, just, you know, look at a lot of different RPG podcasts, RPG YouTube mm-hmm. channels, all that kind of stuff, especially ones that do reviews. Um, and then, you know, if you are sending them like most of, well, not most, most of the people that we send stuff to, I guess, uh, we did send a PDF, but there were some that we sent a print version to um, just like some of the bigger ones because we thought this will work. Now, the downside to doing that besides the cost, it, which can be like the book itself isn't crazy expensive to make, but shipping stuff to certain parts of the country or world, mm. mostly the world, it's real expensive. Um, the other thing, too, is that we didn't really send out that stuff until just before the game launch. So we kind of couldn't just send it by like media mail. You know, we were sending it like oh, by, sure. uh, like priority mail and stuff. So we got there on time. And then the priority mail is not crazy mm-hmm. expensive in the United States. But when you're trying to send something to Canada and have it get there sometime this year, at least right now, it's uh, surprisingly expensive. So um, that kind of stuff is important. So if you're doing, mm-hmm. you know, if you're not doing a print version, you're just doing PDF, you can send it out there. But the downside right. is, is that sometimes people aren't as interested in downloading the PDF to look at it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if they're a smaller, here's the thing, too. People will be like, oh, I'm going to target all the big guys and send stuff to them. You can do that, but it's not crazy likely that they're going to necessarily check it out. Right. That being said, the small people, it's not a bad idea to send them stuff because they are looking for content very frequently and are just mm-hmm. glad to get a free copy of a game, even if it's a PDF. And right. they might put something out that somebody important listens to for some reason, and then it all kind of snowballs, and then maybe something you know better happens right. down the road. Or they you know, become yeah. big at some point, and then one of your f- next games, you know, you guys can oh, yeah. together. Absolutely, yeah. If they if they get big and they keep talking about how much they enjoyed that game of yours or whatever, that kind of thing, that down the road can Or people go back to too. old episodes, yep. Yeah. Um, so between the YouTube and we've been, like, we did a lead up to the actual launch date. We had been basically saying, oh, this is like a secret project that we're working on. And people were wondering about it, and we weren't telling them the answer. And then for about a week before it launched, we basically started doing a... We built a little calendar of like, mm-hmm. okay, um, on you know the Friday before, there's going to be this video and this video. And then the, you know, the Saturday before it, then there's going to be this and this on Twitter. And then on Sunday before, we're doing this and that. And so we had this little spreadsheet figured out with all the different things we were going to do. And we basically just kind of sort of made these like posts that didn't really explain things too much. 
but it kind of got people mm-hmm. hyped and that was the concept and it, it worked relatively well. And then on Friday yeah. morning this is when it, we, we, you know, it was announced through our, through the YouTube. Um, generally, you know, if you're starting out, it's probably just better to launch it when you're ready and then start trying to promote it. Um, you know, like if, I said, we'd send the, some stuff out early, but yeah. in the before times when we got to meet mm. people at conventions and stuff like that, <laughs> yeah, is there anything yeah. else that you would have done differently or that you would suggest that people could um, do? Yeah. As conventions start to kind of come back, I would definitely say that, uh, if you're indie, if you're DIY, I would stay away from getting a booth, especially mm-hmm. at a big convention and even at small ones. There's just it's an expense that you're probably not going to get a lot of, re- you know, you're not going to recoup very easily. I think mm-hmm. it's better, especially with small conventions, go to the conventions and be a DM or, you know, run some games because then people oh, will yeah. be like, I'll look at it and go, OK, cool. Like I run like I go to local conventions and run um, a game from Ganesha Games, Ganesha Games, Ganesha, whichever. Um, mm-hmm. I like to run Song of um, Blades and Heroes. And just because mm-hmm. it's a cool game to teach people who have never played miniatures before, I think. And it works really right. well. And yeah, I know that uh, Lee does, does a lot of that to learn, you know, where he demos exactly. his games and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's rare that a game, even though the people haven't heard of it, it's rare that you're going to be sitting there with nobody. Somebody's going to walk up, you know? Right. And so you can kind of do that. And that's generally cheaper than getting a booth and selling stuff. Now you can't sell stuff obviously when you're just running demos, but you can at least tell people about it and maybe they'll go home and buy it when they get home. You know, there's that you can certainly give them a card, you know, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And when you're, when you're indie, that's a good idea is to help also build things that way. Because the thing is, is that people will talk about it online. So if someone goes to a convention and has a really good demo game with your thing, they'll go home and mention it on their discord that they like to be on and, or they'll, you know, whatever, Facebook or tweet or who knows. And again, that, that can help cascade. And if you, it it, it takes a grind, but it's a thing. Um, Mm. If you get to the point. Also at conventions to, to meet the content producers and stuff too. Um, so, that, yeah. you know, rather than sending stuff out blindly to, you know, make the connection of, hey, I watch your channel and stuff. Are you interested in, you know, doing this kind of stuff? You know, uh, could I send you this game for, to look at or something like that? You know, you you you'd be prepared for rejections and, you know, sure. th- and there and don't try not to, you know, take it take seriously or take it personally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, because some are just overwhelmed, but yeah, I, you know that's probably a little bit better than someone just blindly sending you, you know, a thing or or even saying like, "Hey, I'm running a demo upstairs." You know, if you if you're free, I'd love to show you. You know, yeah, stuff, absolutely, so. absolutely. Um, no, I mean, there's there's different ways through conventions and things like that to do that, um, but it is. It's at it, big conventions. It's really expensive, and at small conventions, it doesn't have as much reach. But there's still. I think there's still mm-hmm. reasons to do it. And even at small conventions, it definitely can help. Um, I think as far as things that we learned uh, in, in this first go round, and again, like I said, we are planning on trying to, like we're looking at probably making a game a year, I think. You know, again, we both have day jobs and we both have video channels and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are looking at trying to make a game once a year. Um, and we have actually ideas at least for like next three or so, kind of already nice. kind of like yeah. figured out. Um, but the things we learned, uh, definitely pay a copy editor, like actually pay somebody who does this well, and there's plenty online. Um, but we, we, one of our play testers, as it turns out, like I said, uh, kind of does this and stuff. And I, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll be doing that from now on, obviously, uh, because there were some, like some errors and stuff and, and whatnot. Um, not a ton, but some, um, and that's just a annoying, I don't know. I, I, I find it annoying as a person who's like, Hey, I found a spelling error on tw- page 12 and I, I'm not annoyed at them. I'm annoyed at myself for making that spelling error or whatever. Um, stupid InDesign does not have, I mean, it has built in spell check, but it's not like normal modern spell check, like every other app out there, including like Chrome oh, and everything, you know, sure. where it like underlines a word and is like, this isn't a word. And you're like, Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. The only way to get spell check to work in InDesign that, I, that I've seen is to actually go in and like click on the thing and say, run spell check on this. Like it's 1995. And so anyway, that's, you know, that's, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, that's important. Uh, we've also found that um, it, at least in our product line, because it's miniatures and stuff, it seems like it was probably, we should have launched with a battle report video. We should have launched with a video that's like a battle report. Um, also should have launched with a how to play video. I'm actually in progress and working on that. Um, what we launched with was basically each of our YouTube videos. And then we launched with um, a video about like what the game is kind of, which is more thematic than anything. But um, we want, you know, people are like, well, so how does it play? 
you know, uh, like how do I do things in the game and stuff like that. And so that's one of the situations that we kind of need to probably um, work on that a little bit better for the, for the future. Definitely a battle report. Now there've been already at least one battle report out already by as, as of Tuesday game launched on oh, Friday. That's, so that's very cool. Yeah. 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 So, so that's cool. And I think there's going to be some others as well. But the other thing is too, that we've, we've gotten asked a lot is like we used a bunch of different 3D printed models in the video and in pictures in the book, like we mentioned. And we've had a lot of people being like, what is this miniature on page 12? Like, this is super cool. I want to get this. And so we're going to do a, a blog post that basically says, here's all the information about all the different stuff. And, you know, there you go. Oh, okay. we, sh- yep. we should have we should have launched with it is what it was. And it was a situation of like, sure you get down to a point where you get that minimum viable product thing and you're like, okay, well we can't, if we have to get this, 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 and this done, it won't launch till three months from now. So, you know, right. kind of, but, um, yeah. So, Very cool. um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of it. Um, it was kind of high level, you know, um, there's a lot of things that you can learn from YouTube. Like if you're like, okay, I'm going to design my game and I'm going to use my own software, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do my own layout. I mean, you know, well, you're going to want to learn a bunch of things about like InDesign or Affinity, De- Affinity Designer or any of those, you know, you mm. can teach yourself a lot, but there's also things that you're like, you know, this person already knows it. So is it better for me to teach myself and spend all that time or is it better for me to pay them to do it? You know, right. or, you know, that's, that's the option for you. That's what you got to figure out. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Um, so where can people f- f- that are like, okay, Adam, you keep talking about your game, but where do I get a copy? Where do they, oh. where do they go? Uh, they can go to, um, like if you just go to snarlingbadger.com, um, you can go there and there's just a big old uh, demon right there on the front page. And you can click a button and it'll take you to the Rain and Hell page. Um, you could also just go to snarlingbadger.com slash rain and hell. And by rain, it's R E I G N. So it's not like rain, like it's raining outside. <laughs> um, uh, you can go to rain and hell game.com, but sometimes that's a little, <clears throat> we've been finding for some reason, there's been like some sort of squirreliness. I don't, it's a go daddy, uh, forward, uh, to the, the normal snarling badger site. And I don't know why, but some people are like, I got a weird message that said that it wasn't secure, which is, strange because most of the time it's not a problem but just yeah. you know i would try those other ones because it's a, it's more likely to get you there for sure uh, and then um but yeah we've got all the information there and like i said the print version or sorry the P- pdf version is like 10 bucks american and print version is 15 bucks and it, you can get it with the pdf free so you could get both of them for 15 bucks total um but yeah it's uh, that's pretty much it so cool. yeah absolutely Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Game 4 Podcast. If you've got questions or comments and you're watching on YouTube, please leave a comment below. If you're listening via your favorite podcast player or just aren't into the whole YouTube comment section thing, then you can feel free to reach out to us via email at podcast at imgame4.com. You can also keep up to date with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check out our website at www.imgame4.com. That is www. Dot I-A-M-G-A-M-E-F-O-R dot com. Thanks. Thanks.